Hello, in this lesson I will give you some concepts of computer programs. Things like writing some codes, what are programs, what are commands, and how to use the Visual Studio integrated development environment. So let's start from the most important questions when you are new in programming. What is this? What is to program? So to program means to give commands, commands to the computer and tell the computer please do something, please uh, enter some data or please do some calculation or print something or take something and move it to another location, things like that. So this is an example of simple command. Console.writeWine and in, in brackets we give some text. The console is some kind of object and write one is some kind of action. So we ask the computer, please write on the console this wine holding this text. We'll learn a, a little bit more about comments later, but now just take this as an example. So comments are lined up one after another. We can take a, uh, give a group of comments, sequences of comments to the computer and this is how they form a computer program. A computer program is just first step, do this, second step, do, do this, third step, do this. So it's a sequence of wind up one after another comments. It's called computer program or script or there are many uh, words to say it. So a computer program is a sequence of Comments. It's also called algorithm. If we have a sequence of comments that achieves some result, we call it algorithm. For example, we can have a algorithm to find the square root of given integer number, which is co consists of many steps which are done one after another to achieve this result. Programs are written in some programming language, a language like C Sharp, like Java, like JavaScript, like Python, PHP, C, C++, Swift, Go, Rust, and many, many, many other languages. Languages are a way to express the comments we want to give to the computer. So we can run this program, uh, this simple command, here in an online tool called RepoIt. So this is our command. The command is put into a program. This is the command. It's put into a program and we will learn a little bit more about this later. But now we can press the run button and the command is executed. When we run this command, it says, please console.print. This is the console. This is the this black window is called console. So let's get back here in our lesson. Computer programs uh, maybe may consist of several comments aligned one after another. For example, this, this is a program of three comments. The first says, uh, please give uh, uh, a remember into variable called size the number five. Later, print this size as a text and the size as a value. Later print area and then multiply the size by size and print the entire result. The output of this program is something like size is 5, area is 25 and that's all. We can run this program again on this tool called RepoIt which is just an online development environment which supports C Sharp and if we run it we'll see that the, the size is 5, this one prints this text and this one of code or command prints this text. So programming is a sequence of, uh, is about writing programs which are essentially sequences of C-sharp commands or commands in other, another language. So Programming sometimes uh, involves some other steps additional to just the comments. For example, in the C-sharp language, we need to define a class, to define a method, and to define the comments inside this method. So a C-sharp program usually starts with some uh, things like using system, which just includes the system namespace. This is something like a library with uh, very... Uh, comments which we use very often and then we define a class which starts here and uh, ends here 
and in it we define this public static void main and we start and end it here so assume that all this here is always part of our program we cannot write c-sharp program with a single line of code we need to put this code inside so the actual commands the first command the second command and the third command these commands are put inside this block inside this main it's called method inside the main method so the entire program looks like this did you see that we have three commands here but they are wrapped into some other additional things something like when you purchase a mobile phone it comes with a cover it comes with some additional uh, instructions with some book with some um, additional things around it but essentially it's the phone mobile phone in the uh, this is what you purchase so similarly when you write c -sharp programs you put your code here but it's wrapped into some cover into some <laughs> package okay uh, so when we program and when we write code we use a programming language and we often use either a compiler or interpreter so the programming language defines a set of rules it's it defines the syntax syntax is uh, the rules that we follow when we write comments for example in this language c sharp at the end of each common we put semicolon and this comes from the syntax of the c-sharp language if we write some other language this might be different so languages are either compiled like c-sharp c++ c um, pascal and many other languages or interpreted which means that they are directly executed like javascript like python and like uh, typescript and many other scripting uh, languages the compiler it's a computer program which transforms the programming code on the so the so-called source code to machine code so we have programming code the source code of our program and machine code which is a code understandable for the computer and during the compilation uh, the compiler finds the mm, syntax errors in the code, so finds the problems and uh, alarms us if we have problems. The interpreters run differently. They execute directly the code line by line. So for example, they just say, see the line, uh, read it and execute it. It finds the syntax error during the runtime, not directly uh, before that, like the compiler. And, uh, I can illustrate all this using the Visual Studio Integrated Development Environment. So what is IDE, Integrated Development Environment? This is a program for writing programs. For example, if you are familiar with Microsoft Word, it's a program for writing articles, for writing uh, uh, some pa papers, for writing some books, or this is a program for writing text in IDE integrated development environments are programs for writing programs this is the program inside this program okay uh, the IDE saves the times and teases the process of coding because it's integrated you can write the code you can run it you can test it you can trace it if you if it has some bugs or problems you you can design user interface and you can do many other things so for programming in C-sharp, we usually use the Visual Studio ID. This is the name of the program. Like when we uh, use electronic tables, we might use Excel or OpenOffice uh, Calc. Uh, alternatives to Visual Studio for coding in C-sharp are the program MongoDevelop and the Rider. Rider is cross-platform, very powerful, but it's paid to. Uh, very nice ID for C-sharp. So, Try coding, but before that, I will show you Visual Studio. So I have it open already, and it is uh, it it consists of something like this. This is my solution explorer. It holds my program and its 
pieces, its parts. So the program uh, defines a class, class program, and we have public static, static void main, and we have some commands. I'll start with some very simple program. Console dot write wine, there is out complete, and I say please write wine hello. If I want to execute to run this program, I press Control plus F5. So this one, and it says hello. And it says our program is finished, please press some key to continue. This is the ID, this is the Visual Studio. Uh, I can write a sequence of commands. For example, I can write console.writewine, a second command for me, writewine. Um, uh, how are you? It, it will print how are you. So I have a program consisting of two different commands. Okay, and I can write another another text, for example, uh, welcome to C sharp. And now I have a uh, three commands: first common, second common, third common. And when I click Control F5, this is what I achieve. If I take the other program here. Uh, it will be, I can copy it, control C, control V. It will say that I remember in the size the number 5. Later I print size and 5. Later I print this text area equals to, and then I calculate this expression size by size, multiply it and print the result. So the result will be size is 5 and area is 25. This is a simple program of three uh, commands and I can even execute it one by one like this. I click F10, F10 and now I'm here. F10, size is 5. Now I print the size. Alt tab, I print, I press Alt tab. It says what is currently shown by this command. I execute the next command pressing F10 and the result is printed on the console. And finally the program stops. So this is what we have in the IDE integrated development environment. We can write code, you can navigate through the program pieces or classes, components, etc. And we can run the command the program with Ctrl F5 and we can trace the program pressing F10 and F10 many times. So, uh, this, this uh, language called C Sharp, which we use for our programs here, uh, is done by, is running by interpret a, a compiler. Compiler which transforms the programming code into machine code. There is a compilation. When we press F6, it's built. This is the compilation compile. Okay, if we have some wrong common here, and if we build it with F6, it will be the pro problem will be found during the compilation. This compilation says that we have some problem. So, but if we use interpretator, like for example, if we have a web browser, we press F12, F12, and we go here at the console. Uh, we can just say size is 5 and it says yes I agree the size is 5 thank you I understand you and now it, I can say console.walk please print the size and it says 5 please print the size multiplied by size and it will print 25 this is a interpreter interpreter uh, uh, this is uh, the Java script languages enter Interpretator. Uh, <laughs> okay. It's incorrect comment, of course, and it says a problem. So, in resume, we found what are programming, writing comments, what is a computer program, a sequence of comments. Uh, we need a programming language like C Sharp and JavaScript to write programs. 
this is a simple program but this is not the entire problem this is these are only the comments this is an entire problem with a program which consists of the using of the class definition method definitions and the comments inside and for writing programs we need a programming language which might be a compiler based on interpretator based uh, compiler based languages are c sharp for example this is compiler based language and we have a compilation and uh, interpretator based like javascript uh, and this is the example this console which comes from our web browser when we press f12 f12 okay so ideas are tools for writing comments and try this try this run visual studio write this comment stop on the video on the pause and try to run this code because learning programming is done by coding by doing not by listening hello in this lesson i will show you how to write your first console application in visual studio it will be a simple hello world or hello c sharp program but we will pass through all the steps, starting Visual Studio, creating a project, writing the code, running the code, and finally submitting your code in the uh, judge system where it will tell you whether it is correct or not. So let's start. First, when we want to create a, a console application in Visual Studio, we start, should start Visual Studio. I already has, have it started, so this is what I have. I will close this solution to be uh to to start from the scratch from the zero okay so let uh, the next step is to fi say file new console application and choose this windows console application i will show you this this wife so i press file new project file new project see file new project in microsoft visual studio File new project and in this dialog window I choose Visual C Sharp and console app.net core or this will also work. .NET framework, these are the two variants of .NET, uh, but the latest is .NET Core. So I press this. I use the allocation C projects. Uh, usually I, I use for my projects and console app for example uh, example February uh, because I have many examples that's why I choose unique name so next Visual Studio will create this project for me here at the solution explorer I have a solution in this solution I have a project and in the project I have one file in this file i have this code it's called program.cs and this is my program it says hello world i can change it to hello c sharp and press ctrl f5 so it's a program which just pre prints hello c sharp i can add another command with cw tap tap i this is the shortcut for console right one i can print uh, welcome for example so i will have two lines hello c sharp the first and the second welcome and that's all i have so this is my program and i run it with control f5 i can run it step by step with f10 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 again f10 out tab this is what i have here uh, and i can press f10 again to run this yellow line it executes the next comment and prints its result and if i run f10 again the program will finish uh, so this is how i create program this is the the place where my program is it's called hello c sharp and this is the program so sometimes in the different versions of visual studio you may have different things here in different files here for example we don't have app config in, in my visual studio uh, and also this one is something uh, which are uh, some libraries which are uh, injected in our code but here we have only using system so if you use different or later version of visual studio things may be slightly changed okay um, so we write the code here 
where, for example, if this is the code, we go here after the bracket and we write our program here. Okay? If we write the code a different place, for example, if I write console right one here, it will not compile. It will say, yeah, you have errors, you have invalid tokens, build errors, things like that. Why? Because the command is outside of the place where it should be. It should be here. You, you, you have namespace, in it you have class, in it you have static void main. The namespace is, is not obligatory, so we can delete this and this one. And we can select this and press shift up to move it on the left. And it will work again. But all the rest is obligatory. For example, this one is obligatory, otherwise the program will not compile. Okay? This one is, is not also required. So the shortest version of this program is this. Hello is with double L. Wow. Um, okay. So what's indentation? Indentation means that if you have several commands, they should be on the same uh, indentation level here. Here, the space here and here should be the same because these are the same commands. But if we have something like a for loop with from 0 to, to, to 10, from 1 to 10, for example, the things, the commands which are inside the, the block are identical, which means that if this one is inside this one, it should be moved on the right. If this one, this code, is inside this, it should be moved on the right. I believe you will understand the idea. The idea is that we want to make the code readable. So, if we want to execute a piece of commands here, they will be moved on the right. Uh, and it's clearly visible that this code stays inside this for loop here. If we don't use indentation, this code is quite unreadable. For example, if I forget this bracket, is it visible which bracket is forgotten? No, it's not, because it's broken code. But if I do it right now, it's clearly visible that this bracket does not its corresponding, because brackets always stay vertically one uh, under another. See? This is the concept of indentation. Okay? So, writing the command, we have done this very several times. Uh, we can use autocomplete. If we say con, uh, the autocompleter will say, oh, do you mean console? I, I say yes. Control space uh, starts this autocomplete. I press enter and it completes the console. When I press dot, it will try to um, offer some the next word I want to type. So if I say write, it will offer write or write one. With the uh, arrows, I can change. So I choose write one, enter, now the bracket, and semicolon. All the operators in C sharp, all the statements in C sharp uh, commands, they should finish with semicolon. So I press uh, some text. If I want to print some text, hello C sharp, for example, I need to put it in brackets. And I, when I press Control F5, the program runs. If I forgot this, uh, if I f forgot this, um, it will not work. See the. Because it's text. Text should be encapsulated like this, or with apostrophes, or with quotes, like this. So, not all programs are correct. If your program is correct, it may be started. It will be compiled successfully. If your program is not correct, it will not start. So, this is how we write the comment. I already did this, and I run it through, through Control F5. Control F5 will show the result 
and after that we'll show this one please press any key any key means uh, any key maybe the space the enter the escape or or some other okay uh, if we run this one the green it will also run the program if we press it but the program output will dis disappear because it's printed here and immediately the window is closed that's why we want here start without debugging which is control f5 debug start without debugging and now after the finishing of the program its window is still not closed we have time to see what happened the next thing is to get familiar with the judge system the judge system at softuni is an automated uh, place where you can run your programs and you can get feedback whether they are correct or not so you have a link this link which means judge softuni uh, bg or softuni.org uh, and we have this contest and at this in this contest cost contest we have several problems first problem several second third problem and when we send the problems we will be able to mm, evaluate our solutions automatically what i mean so let's open this i will close a little some of the mm, tabs to to enable you to see what happens so i have this contest is a contest programming basics programming basics book c sharp book all the problems from this book and this training course are here so for the first section or first topic or first chapter first steps in programming this clearly corresponds to uh, let me just show you to this one okay so our book has chapters in each chapters has a judge you have one judge contest here one judge contest here etc so we are here now and uh, when we go in the judge we press practice in order to use the judge you need to log in okay i will log in with some account or you need to register here okay uh, you just need to select username password uh, country and email standard registration or you can just click uh, facebook registration login with facebook or with google uh, so when you have an account you can log in for example this one and you can send your code here i can put your code here uh, my code here and i submitted it for uh, evaluation if i refresh it says compile time error which means that, that this program is incorrect which is the true if i want to submit this program i copy it control a which means select all then copy control c then out tab then i click here i say paste or control v and this is my program and i can say please submit this program for this hello c sharp submit and i press refresh after a few seconds and the judge will say oh it's correct you have 100 out of 100 points so you are done with this problem i can use the next problem and submit some solution and if this solution is correct the judge will tell me Thank you, it's correct. Now the solution will be incorrect. I have a program which compiles successfully, but it's incorrect. It has zero correct output, produces zero correct output. So that why? Because it's different problem with the same solution. Maybe each problem should have different solution. So this is what I wanted to show you that we have this soft unit judge. You can explore it. There is a video how it works. It supports many many languages like C sharp, like Java, like JavaScript, like PHP, Python, and many others. 
and uh, you can use this navigation uh, programming basics and programming basics books because we have many other contents and we are here at the C-sharp book. So these are the problems for this first chapter, for the second chapter, for the third chapter, etc, etc, etc. Or if you are watching a video training, so know that we are here. You have the rec link, so I can press practice, which is the same like clicking here. It is the same location, see? Uh, I need to press practice. So this and this is the same thing. And here I can put the mm, my solution. If I just print hello without C sharp, it will say that my solution is incorrect. I submitted this solution and now I press refresh, 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 and it says oh incorrect. I can ask for details and it will tell me oh you need to produce expected output is hello C sharp, but your output is just hello without C sharp. Obviously, we have an incorrect solution. Uh, so this is how the judge works, and I highly recommend that when you solve your problems, just to check them in the judge. So try yourself. Install Visual Studio, run it, create a console application, write your code here. Hello, uh, console right line, hello C sharp. And finally, run it with control F5, ensure it works correctly. And finally, click in the judge. Uh, I already showed how to find this contest and submit it in order to see that it really works correctly. So, try it yourself again. Don't listen and watch videos. It's many times better that you write code, that you run code that you do it with your hands. This is how the programming can be learned. Try it. Okay, now we'll start with the programming part of things. First, we'll start with learning how to read numbers from the terminal. If you followed along in the previous videos of this course, you already know how to do this or you've seen how to do it. But now we're going to a bit more details how it works, how to do it properly. Basically, if you want to read a number from the terminal, you have some functions to do it. And you can find them in this line here. Uh, first, you create something called a variable, and about variables we'll talk a bit later. Then, you write in dot parse, brackets, and something you put inside. We'll go through this for in these lines in details, but basically that's how you read the number and let's just go into a bit more details here in Visual Studio this time. Now, what I've done is I just created a new project and that's it. Now, before I start anything, I have to uh, clean it up a bit by removing the things which are not necessary. For example, I remove these using directives here. The namespace is not important for the programs we're making. Um, the class should be called simple calculations demo for example um, this is the main function and by the way we don't need this and here we can rename this to simple calculations demo okay cool now let's start well, how do we read the number well the first thing we gotta, gotta have is a place where we put this number the way we do that is by declaring a variable. A variable we declare in the following, we found a way for now. Okay, in the next videos you will study this in a bit more detail, but we write var, then we write a name, an identifier for our variable. Basically the identifier is there to just name, so we have some storage somewhere, um, and we have to reference this storage in some way. So instead of referencing it by address, like some arbitrary number with came, which came up, we can add, we can reference it by name. So we gotta give this thing a name and now call it number. Now, I write the equal sign. The equal sign means I want to assign the thing which you find on the right to the variable on the left, okay? or the thing we find 
the left. Um, basically, you can imagine that now what you have is an open box. You have a box which is empty and it's now time to fill it. And the equal sign says, look, I want you to get whatever you have here and, us, and put it inside the box. And I want to reference it later. That is, I want to be able to use it later for whatever I find necessary. Okay? Now, moving on. The first thing we gotta do is we have to read something from the, the user. Well, how do we read something from the user? Basically, for different applications, reading input happens in a different way. Uh, for example, if you are writing a graphical application, uh, you would read input from the user by reading some text box, text boxes he has to fill. You've already seen that in previous videos. If you want to write a web application, what you have to do is you have to give some form for the user to fill in or some buttons to click. Okay? But currently we're writing a terminal application, a console application. And in console applications, the way we read anything from the terminal is by reading as a line of text which the user inputs. Okay? I'll show it right here. Before we continue here, I'll just comment this. This is something we've not talked about, but if you put this um, back forward slashes, it means that you are commenting out the lines. A comment is something which doesn't get in, doesn't get into account in your program. Uh, it's not something which the compiler cares about. It's something it ignores. The comment normally is there to just, for example, provide some documentation like saying what you're doing here or something like that. And it can be used for just temporarily ignoring some line like I'm doing here. Because now I don't want to delete the whole line because uh, I will write it out anyways at one point. I'm just commenting it out so that I ignore it for now and later I'll get back to it. Okay? Now, I made my comment here and now I write ha, so, uh, an instruction which allows me to read something from the terminal. So how do I do that? Well, first, since we're reading something from the terminal on the, or the console, uh, what we have to do is we have to use the toolbox, uh, the tool actually which provides us utilities from reading the terminal. Okay, and that is called console. Console is a class. It's a class found in some library we're using. To, to, to be more uh, particular, it's a class found in this library called system. Okay. Um, and if you're just curious what this using system is, where does it come from? Well, basically a library is something which is packed in some format and it's stored somewhere. And I will show it to you. If I go to C, uh, Windows, and I write system.dll, at one point, if I'm lucky enough, this we'll find a file called systemdll. Systemdll is just a file in some form, okay? But this file actually can be included. It can be included in your uh, uh, applications and used. And if you don't have this file, you won't be able to use it. So if you wanna include, for example, some utilities I give you as a friend of yours, uh, I'll have to send you a file which you have to include in your project. And if you want to use system.dll, which is a library which provides us the console uh, utility, we have to find it first. We have to have it on our system. And luckily, system is something which comes by default in Windows. So you can just find it and it's normally stored somewhere in the Windows directory. And here I'll hopefully find it. There are a lot of system things. Um, well, it's a bit harder. There are a lot of things. Man, I just want to find system here. Well, isn't that so simple? Okay, but any, anyways, uh, look at this. Cool. So we have system dot 
collections, okay? Dot ni, but ignore this ni, I'm not sure what it stands for to be honest. Let's take something like, okay, system.design. So we want to include system.design and we go here and say using system.design. It doesn't find it now because we have to reference it, okay? In order to re but look, it has system.data, okay? System.data we can find and write system.data.dll. If I'm lucky enough for this to find it fast, yes, there it is. You have system.data.dll. It's basically a file which we include in our portal. This is something I'm showing just to be aware uh, of the magic which happens behind the scenes. But that's how we include, we find two boxes. So we have this toolbox called system, it's somewhere in our Windows directory, the project knows where to find it, and now we can use the tool called console from it. Okay, now console is a class. Basically a class is the analog of a tool in the real world, okay? And if I want to use something from this tool, some functionality, for example, if I have a screwdriver and I want to use it to uh, make a hole in the wall, if it, you can use it for that, uh, then what you have to write is the name of the class, screwdriver, dot, and the name of the method which you want to utilize. For example, I might find a method called make hole in wall or something like that. Now, we're not going to make holes in the wall this time, but we're going to write something on the terminal. And so we can use the tool called console and then invoke a method called read line. Read line is a method which reads a line from the terminal. This is the command I want to write and now I click semicolon, okay? And that's it. Now, if I run this program, notice how the program post. There is this blinking cursor there and it doesn't move, it doesn't do anything. This doesn't mean it glitched or anything, it means that it's waiting for input. That's how you get input from the user and now I can type in some stuff and these, this text here is the thing which my program will read okay this is something the program will be able to read and work with okay so if i click enter now the program exited the reason it exited is because we read something from the terminal but it didn't use it for anything so the program just ended okay now let's use it let's write var uh, text equals this. This means, look, I want you to make a box and I want you to put the contents of the thing you read in the box. And after you put it there, I want you to write it out again on the terminal. So I write console.write line. This is the utility for, um, for writing text on the terminal. But in order to write text on the terminal, you gotta give it some parameters. You gotta tell him what to write. So, between these brackets here, of any method, we input some data. We input how we want to use this function, how we want to use this method, okay? And why do we input these parameters? Well, because some functionalities we want to use are good enough to just work on their own without any external input. For example, if I invoke the function read a line from the terminal, it doesn't need any other info. So I can just leave the brackets empty. But there are methods which expect something, which want you to input some something. And one of these functions is console.writeLine. This is not mandatory actually, it's optional. If you don't input anything inside these brackets, it's just going to print out an empty line. I can actually show it to you. If I write some text, notice this empty line here. Okay? That, that's the empty line we actually output. But if you want to output some text, now this has to take some parameters. A parameter is something we input between these brackets. The way we uh, input parameters is by separating them by a, a colon, right? So 
if I want to, let's say, uh, if I have, for example, um, my a remote control. So I have remote control. I write dot. And okay, I'll just go here. It's easier. So I have remote control dot. And now I want to invoke some method. Okay. I want to invoke a method of this remote control, so I uh, write um, set volume. It's a functionality which sets the volume to a given thing. Imagine now that this utility, in order for it to work, you first have to specify a target. That is, what do you want to set the volume of? Would you like to set the volume of your TV, of your stereo, of your car? or something else. So you gotta provide that parameter. So how do you provide them? Well, you write some brackets and inside the brackets you provide the parameters and in the end you write a semicolon. How do you enumerate these parameters? Well, you start writing the input. For example, if I want it to work on my car, I write car or some other, or specify the target in some other way. It can be some kind of number. For example, if I put the number one, it means you're working with a car. If I put the number two, it means you're working with the stereo. But we won't get into that de much details. The point is that you input some parameter. And the next parameters afterwards, for example, the next parameter might be what volume you want to set the car to. In order to input it, you write a colon like this. So you write your colon and you input the second parameter, which is, let's say, 32, which means 32% out of 100, okay? And that's how you use a method. So you have some parameters, you input, okay? And you separate them by a colon. These parameters you input between the brackets. You don't input them outside. You don't input them somewhere else. You input them inside the brackets. That's how you specify the parameters of a function. Okay? Now let's put some parameters here. If you want to put a parameter between this one, I can say, look, I want you to print out this text I just read. That's it. That's how you specify a parameter. Now I run this application, I write this, and I got it printed out as I expected. I input the parameter and now the console write line function actually printed out what it, it needed. Okay? Um, so that's it for reading lines of text. In the next video we're going to see how to actually get numbers from the terminal, not just text. Okay, now we'll see a bit more complex example of formatting text and numbers. Uh, if you recall in the previous video, I uh, wanted you to try yourself to read some uh, names from the terminal, age, some other data like ID, and print it out in a nice way. Well, this is actually an exercise where you do just that. What we have to do is we have to read the first name, the last name, the age and the town and print it out. So how do we do that? Well, first name and last name we read in a similar way as we've done thus far. Then we have reading age. Well, when we are reading age, we use an integer. So we write in h is equal to console dot write line, read line, sorry, and we have town. Okay. Notice now that we have an error. What is this error? Can you guess? I will leave you a bit of time, and I want you to pause this video now and try to guess why we have an error. Okay. Assuming you did pause it, we continue. Well, actually the error is that we are ha we have a number, but we're reading a string, and we have to convert the string to a number. So we've already done that. If you were paying attention, you would be able to do this. And what we have to do is parse. We write in the parse of the text we read. That's it. Moving on now, we have to format that in a nice way. 
Well, how do we format it? Where we write you are first name, last name, comma, uh, something years old. Sorry. Person, a something years old person from um, some down dot. That's it. That's our format. I will. Uh, put it here just to be more visible and now we start inputting the arguments the first argument is the one which is with a zero so we write first name then we write last name and these two will come here and here that's how we input the arguments okay first and last name the next argument is age, so we just write it out and the final argument is the town. And now when I write hello, my name is Preslav Mikhailov, I am uh, of course 60 years old and I am from Sofia. What I get as a result is that you are Preslav Mikhailov, a 60 years old person from Sofia. That's it. Let's test our code now in here. Again, we go to our judge system. If I have to log in again this time, I'll click remember me. Okay, log in. And we have greeting by name, nope. Concatenate data, maybe it's this, let's see. Oh, it's this one. Okay, so we got 100 points. That's it. That's for a bit more complex formatting. Essentially, what you have to remember is that when you have a string, you can format it using this console.write line method. You input a string and you input some placeholders. The placeholders are the things which are in curly brackets. In these curly brackets, you input numbers and these numbers say which argument after this comma will be put on that place in the string and then you of course list the argument that's it now go on and try it yourself if you haven't done the previous challenge i gave you try it now uh try this code yourself write it out in visual studio input your names and age and maybe experiment with something else for example i want you to try uh, printing out this information plus an additional timestamp which says what's the current date think about that how can you read a date and how can you format it in a nice way in a string that's it see you in the next video okay now it's time to learn how to use whatever we've learned thus far we learned how to compare numbers now it's time to apply it and the way we're going to apply it is by learning how to do conditions, how to do checks and do something with these checks. Here is an example. So normally in computer programming, in C Sharp in particular, oftentimes we want to do some conditions. Let's say you have a site like softunit.bg and you want to go there and you want someone to log in. And you want to check if the number, if the user, sorry, inputs a valid username and a valid password, I want you to let him in. Okay? So you want to do that check. Now, the, having this condition means that you can't execute the same code for two different people. You can, you could, but it's not always the case. What, when do you have a difference? Well, if in one case, you have one person who correctly inputs his username and password, you will lock him, lock him in. But in the other case, if you have someone who doesn't input his credentials correctly, you will display an error message. So you have two different branches you want to go to depending on the result of a check. And how do you do a check? Well, here is an example we have here. We use something called an if statement. An if statement, what it does is first you it has some syntax you write it like that you write the keyword if just like that it's chosen 
it's not something you can modify that's just how things are then you put some brackets but note that the brackets are normal brackets not curly ones then you have some curly brackets and input some commands what does this do well basically it means look i want you to check if this condition is true what do i mean by condition well it means an operation which retur returns either true or false what's such an operation well the operation 5 plus 10 is not a condition because it returns a number it returns the number 15 the operation hello plus soft tuning is not a valid condition because it inputs as a it outputs as a result a string it outputs hello soft unit but if you have the operation is a number greater than the other that operation returns as a result true or false and if an operation returns as a result true or false independent of how it achieved it that's a condition so if you have comparison you have a condition with the operators we learn if you have some kind of procedure which can which occurs and in the end returns true or false you have a condition for example the procedure might be check if the user is valid that can contain multiple steps is not simply checking two numbers it would require you to first go and see whether a username with a some string already exists if it does exist then do something else in order to invoke an error message and finally return return true or false that's a condition and it's a more complex one you see there are multiple steps and these steps can be numerous but the thing is that whatever you do whatever legwork you do in order to achieve it if in the end you have a true or false that's still a condition you'll see that later on in your programming training how you do that but now we're only going to use simple conditions like comparing two numbers okay later on you'll learn how to use some more complex things so we have an example here what's the example imagine that some person inputs you a grade that's the grade he has in his math subject in school and you want to output the message excellent if the grade is greater than 5.5 now this might be a bit unfamiliar to you depending on what region region you're living in but here we're using the bulgarian grading system the bulgarian grading system starts from contains the grades 2 3 4 5 sorry i'll switch to yellow so it contains 2 3 4 5 6 which correspond to f c hmm. sorry this is b i am not sure what the american one was d. okay so it's d c b a okay so you have this that's the things they correspond to it's kinda and if someone has the grade 5.5 that means that he's in between these two and if it's greater than 5.5 that's an excellent okay although it's not a full six so that's some something to have in mind which is just necessary for this exercise so we want to say if you have this number then output something how do we output something based on a condition well first we do an if statement as we said we have an if statement and we have a condition what do we do afterwards well we write curly brackets these curly brackets um pin show us that we are starting a new block a new block of code but the trick here is that this block of code will only execute if the condition is met so if you have some let's say hmm, okay i got white if you have for example um some commands console right when something console right when something console right when something these commands are sequential they happen one after the other and 
it doesn't matter there is no condition they always unconditionally execute but if you have console right point something if something console right point and then you have console right line here you have these curly brackets I'm drawing them very badly I don't have my pen today but that doesn't matter so here we, we have these conditions here and the thing is that here these will execute unconditionally they'll always execute only when some extreme circumstance occurs then the second or the third console right one won't happen but here in the other case these two will always happen because they're on the same level but this one will only happen if the condition we have here is met that's it and we have a task now our task is to say if someone first someone inputs a grade that will always happen then you have a condition if that grade is greater than 5.5 then output something but that outputting will only happen if the grade is greater than 5.5 it won't happen in our cases and then continue the normal execution of the problem how do you apply that how, how, how have you where have you encountered this this might sound strange but you're using that every day imagine that you are going to the shop and you want to buy some groceries you want to buy some milk you want to buy some bread you want to buy some tomatoes let's say and then you will always buy this in the, in, in, unconditionally in, independent of whatever the circumstances are unless something extreme happens like a zombie apocalypse or invasion you will always buy those products but you have a condition and that condition is that if in the shop you see a chocolate bar of your favorite chocolate you would buy that as well but you would only buy that if that is there now the condition can be different for example the condition could be if it's saturday buy a chocolate bar only if it's saturday because on saturday you have a cheat day and you don't follow your diet so in on saturday you allow to cheat and you buy chocolate apart along with the other groceries so the what's the thing here you have several commands buy tomatoes buy bread and buy milk which always happen and you have one fourth command which happens only when a, a given condition is met in order to express that in computer software for example if you don't want to always go to the shop to buy your products you, you you're a very good programmer and you've created your own robot who goes to the shop for you in order to tell him what to do you have to create a program and the program you have to write is one which does the thing you're doing in real life computers are machines which automate stuff and you want to automate your grocery shopping so to your robot you what you say is hey i want you to go to the shop if um buy milk tomatoes whatever and if it's saturday i want you to buy chocolate as well in order to achieve that you would use if statements like in this example so let's actually see it um before we go to the example let's say you go to the shop so you say hey go to the you say to a robot go to your shopkeeper in any case so you say hey hello mr frank that's your lovely shop clerk then you say i want some tomatoes and then you say i want some bread you always say i want some because you're a stupid robot you can't do it otherwise and you have to sound all like a robot otherwise they're going to think you're a threat to humanity and kill you so that's an important issue there and you say finally um i want some milk okay and now you want to say the following thing hey i have a date which is outputted someone gives it as an external string and i want to say hey if the date is saturday by the way note how i'm comparing strings here yes you can compare strings if you had done my previous challenge you would know this but if you have two strings and they are the same um, then 
you can use them in comparison with the equals equals operator. Let's get back to our task. So if it's Saturday, I want some I want some chocolate as well. Okay, so you have this condition. And let's test now. What's the date? Well, the date is Monday. Then if it's Monday, I only say hello Mr. Frank, I want some tomatoes, bread and milk, and leave. But if it's Saturday, look what happens now. You have the four strings outputted as before, that you want some tomatoes, bread and milk, but you have the final one as well, which is that you want some chocolate. That's how you conditionally execute code. So you have the, a command which occurs, but it only occurs when a given condition is met. And the condition you have is that the current date is Saturday. That's how you apply an if statement in real life and in computer software. Now let's get back to our task. The task was to have a grade inputted from the terminal. We'll input it in a double. Double, to remind you, is a data type which accepts fractional numbers. And now you say double.parse console.readLine. Okay, so now you say, hey, if the grade is greater than or equal 5.5, I want you to output excellent. So now I input the grade 4, you don't have any result. Yes, we did write the command that you say to the terminal excellent, but since the condition wasn't met, you won't do it. On the other hand, if I input 5.6, now the condition is met and thus you have an excellent score. Okay. So that's the task we have here and let's test it. We have a competition here, which we'll go to. Um, I hope you're familiar with judge. Um, my lovely password here. Now I log in and now I have the task excellent result. So I copy my code, I paste it here, I submit, refresh. And I have 66 out of 100 points. Why is that? Well, there is an additional thing in our task. And that's that if you don't have an excellent score, you want to output not excellent. In that case, what you can use is another new thing called an else statement. How does an else statement work? Well, you have as you show your condition and the result from your condition but you also have an alternative code which executes when the condition is not met. So, the condition is if the grade is greater than 5.5, output excellent. Don't output anything else, just excellent and stop there. But if that condition is not met in, any, in every other case, output not excellent. Okay? So how do you use that to your lovely robot? Well, um, imagine that um, you've become a bit sloppy in your regime. So now you uh, have this new diet, which is that on Saturday you uh, eat chocolate. But if it's not a Saturday, on any other day, you eat, um, instead of a chocolate, you get a protein bar. Okay? So, the way you do that is by using an else statement. To your robot, what you say is go to your shop, buy the three groceries as always, uh, and if it's a Saturday, buy a chocolate. But in any other case, in any other day, in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Sunday, in any other case, I want you to buy a protein bar. How do you achieve that? You use an if statement. Let's see how that happens. So I'll save this, um, copy it somewhere. And now I write, hey, I want you, hello, Mr. Robot. I want you to say, I want some um, milk. I should have saved that um, bread, milk, bread, and tomatoes. And you have your date. Okay, 
Now you want to say, hey, if the date is Saturday, then I want you to get some chocolate. I want some chocolate. So you start your lovely program. Now you write that it's Monday and you'll have only three products. But if it was some Saturday, sat Saturday, you get a chocolate as well. Oh, thank God. Now let's change this. Let's add an additional condition that if it's not Saturday, in any other case, I want you to get a protein bar. So what you write is an else. In the else statement, you don't have the, these brackets here. The reason you don't have them is that the else statement executes on any other condition, in any other case. The else statement executes whenever it's not Saturday, so you don't have to write that. You don't necessarily have to write if it's uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever, whatever. You can just write in any other case, do this. So what's the any other case where you write, I want just a protein bar. Okay, let's do this. Well, imagine it's a Saturday. And notice that the result is as before. Although we have an else statement, that code in the else statement didn't get executed. The reason is that the condition we had was met. Since it's met, we execute that and don't execute the else statement. That is, if it's a Saturday, you only get chocolate, but you don't get a protein bar. On the other hand, let's say it was a Monday, you have the three things as always, but this time you have a protein bar request as well. We didn't have an explicit condition for that, but we did say that if you don't get chocolate, if it's not Saturday, in any other case, buy me protein bar. So that's an L statement. That's how you use it. You use it in any other case. Let's get back to our... Hmm, okay. This is robot program, okay? Robot program. I'll name it that way. Okay. Now I add a new project, which is simple checks demo. Damn. Simple conditions demo. Okay, I add it. Set this as start the project so that we work with it. Okay, and we remove the unnecessary stuff. So we had the grade, double grade is equal to double dot parse, so three line. If grade is greater than or equal to 5.5, then console write one excellent. But we had the additional condition that if it's not, they want, I want you to output not excellent. Let's just see the case in here because I'm not sure not excellent and this is lowercase. Okay, so let's try it now. I input a 4, this is not excellent, I didn't meet the criteria. I input a 5.7, this is excellent, okay? So that's how it works. That's how AL statement works and let's test our program this time in a lovely just system submit refresh and you have zero out of 100 wow why is that well i have i missed my exclamation mark here um oh okay okay this was without the else statement sorry i got i, I made a mistake here well i submit I refresh the the problem previously was not that we were missing an L statement but we needed an exclamation mark you gotta be careful that, about that and the second task with the L statement is this okay submit refresh okay 33 points why is that well let's see it here 
So we check if it's greater than or equal to, and we miss a dot here. Okay, so this is a bit nasty about the judge system, but you have to be careful with the specific things you output. Although you have a correct program, the things you output has to be 100% the same, otherwise it won't match. Okay, so that's the if and else statement. One final thing, when you're writing an if and else statement, you have blocks. Of code as I said and you write them with now ignore this else if statement just imagine it was an else this is not important currently we'll talk about that later but um, now we have curly brackets and as I said in your curly brackets you have your code but you have an option to not put any curly brackets if you have that then your block of code is still there but it's only the first line and I don't recommend you do it. What do I mean? Instead of writing this program this way, I write it this way. Okay, excellent, not excellent. This still works. You still have the same output. I don't need the brackets, I can just write it like this. But the problem with this uh, way of writing it is that if I want to input more than one line, so let's say um, try harder next time this line won't be part of the block of the else statement it's going to be separate from it so writing it this way and this way makes no difference so you gotta be careful about that what am I meaning if I write 5.5 it says excellent try harder next time what I got an excellent thing you still say I should try harder that's not correct man and he, he's right if he tells you that uh, because try harder next time should be in a block if I on the other hand put this inside my block like this everything's going to be okay given that I format everything correctly, of course. Okay, now, if I write 5.5, I get an excellent. If I write 4, I get the correct thing. Okay, so my advice is, in this case, always put curly brackets. You can not, you can just go without putting them, but if you do that, you, you can only put one command. If you put more than one, you get a, a wrong problem in this case you have tomato buy in this case you have only tomato when the color is red okay so that's the example we have here which uh, shows the same thing and now it's your turn go there experiment try um, I want you to go there okay I want you to give you a challenge I want you to go there and write a program that says uh, you know continue a robot program you can call him Robbie or something like that uh, and you want I want to put another condition I wanted to say that if the day is Friday actually look I want you to go there and for you I want you to get the three products which you always get but for any given day take a different thing for example if it's Monday I want you to take a banana if it's Tuesday I want you to take a orange juice if it's Wednesday something else on and on and on so I want you to experiment with that and write that program which for every given day it gets a different um, a different product and I want you to write that if it's not Monday Tuesday Wednesday or any of the days if I output uh, apples then I want you to output this is not the correct date and that's a bit harder we haven't learned how to do that yet but i trust you'll be able to find on your own and that's why this is a challenge so i want you to go there and rock it out see you in the next video well it's time to start with the first thing we'll learn today and that's what a for loop is so what's a for loop well um, let me see how to explain this to you well it's actually something you have needed in your life a lot but we simply don't have however um, fortunately in programming you do have it 
So let's see why would you need it. Well, imagine that you are in your room and you're trying to clean it with a broom. Um, so what do you do if you want to clean your room? So you get a broom, first step, you get a broom and you um, do the same task, which is cleaning this some spot of the room with the broom let's say 100 times until the room is clean of course every time the position changes first you clean here then you clean here and you continue <clears throat> but essentially you are doing the same thing which is just rubbing the floor with a broom and um we have the same problem in programming of course the problem is not, not to clean your room, but the problem is that you have one operation you want to repeat many times in a row. So how do you do that? Um, well, in order to do that, what you can do is you can utilize the, thing, the technique we're going to learn today. So beforehand, let us analyze what are you actually doing when you are cleaning your room in order to you know derive the concept of for loops so you first what you do is you get a broom okay that's the first step then you um, take it with your first hand I shouldn't have intended it um, put your second hand as well and then you go move to the next spot spot which you have to clean and you know um, rub the floor so that's what you do and the thing which is done here is this is the part you let's say initialize so you initialize everything by saying take the broom Put your hands on it and start cleaning. Of course, while you're cleaning, what you do is you get the broom and continue cleaning with it. You don't clean one spot, go put it back and remove your hands, move to the next spot and then go take it again, come back and clean it and repeating for the next. No, you don't do that. You do that once. You only get the broom uh, once you you know initialize it by putting your hands on it and the only thing you're doing is move to the next spot rub the floor move to the next spot rub the floor move to the next spot rub the floor so essentially you have initialization and you have your body so the body is the part which you repeat and in programming we have the same problem and we have it many very very often actually you will encounter it a lot and you will start using for loops almost every time. So it's a very important concept to grasp. grasp. So is there a way, instead of taking this operation and say, okay, move to the next spot, rub the floor, move to the next spot, rub the floor, move to the next spot, rub the floor, 100 times, instead of doing that 100 times, is there a way to say, okay move to the next spot and rub the floor until the room is clean or just to be more specific until you've done it 100 times as we said you need to do it 100 times in order to succeed with cleaning all your room um so is there a way to do this to say look i want you to do that 100 times and yes there is a way and that's how you can use for loops that's what we will learn today so what's a for loop a for loop is a construct by a construct i mean this which allows you to execute a block of code multiple times so what do you have here where well, you have a block of code which is this this baby here and you have a a construct which says repeat this 10 times and that's it that that's essentially what a for loop is of course there are some details about how repeating this 10 times works but essentially understand this 
This whole thing means repeat the body 10 times. And this thing here means, well, come on. I can't write. This is the body. Okay, so that's everything. A for loop is a construct which takes a body and says repeat it several times. For now, don't care about this thing. We will explore this afterwards. For now, understand that you only have a snippet of code, a body, which you want to repeat multiple times. And that multiple times is a predefined step. So, so you say repeat it 10 times, repeat it 100 times, more or less, okay? How, however much you need. That's the most basic form. That's the most essential thing to understand. A for loop allows you to get a snippet and repeat it multiple times. That's it. So now let's ex explore the details of how that's actually executed. Well, actually, what you have is three things in order to repeat something 10 times. In order to repeat something 10 times, what do you do? Well, when you are cleaning your room and you say, I will rub the floor 100 times, how do you know that you have rubbed the floor 100 times? You don't just magically guess it. You do something in your head and that something is counting. So you say once, twice, three, uh, thrice, whatever, and you continue that 100 times. When you get to point 100, you stop. That's how essentially that's the same way a for loop works in programming. So you have a variable which will be your counter. This is it. And you say where you start from. So if you are going to rub the floor 100 times, you say start from one. So one, okay? You do this, it becomes one. You move uh, forward, two, three. So that, that, that first part, which defines where you start at, is the initialization. And that can be anything. And normally it will be one or zero, but you can put it to any value you want. You can say, I want to start at 50. So you can say 50, 51, 52. When would you use that? Well, in real life, you would use that if you want to cheat. Imagine that your coach tells you make 10 laps and you start running and say five, six, seven, and you just continue to 10 because you want to skip five as you're lazy. That's not a good thing to do. Um, and in programming, you can do the same thing. But for now, I'm just mentioning it. Under, we will see more basic examples for now, which we start from smaller values, okay, it's from zero or one. So for simplicity, imagine that we always start from one. The next thing we do is we increase. So we say one, two, three, four, okay? So one, two, three, four. This is called incrementing. And that's this part here. Incrementing means take the value inside a variable and increment it by one. So if you have one, I want it to become two. If you have two, I want it to become three. If you have three, I want it to become four. That's incrementation. So that's the second step. The first one was initialize one, and then you increment two, three, four. Okay, that's the, the second step. And the final step is to check if you've reached the end. And this is the thing which defines whether we've, we've reached the end. In this case, it means stop when, uh, so it means repeat this, repeat this until i is less than or equal to 10. In other words, what we do is we start counting, of course, and we say one. We check if one is less than or equal to 10. It is, so we continue. We continue, it becomes two. We check if two is less than or equal to 10. It is, so we continue. Three, we check if three is less than or equal to 10. We continue on and on and on. Finally, you get to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 
10, you get to 10 and you check if 10 is less than or equal to 10, it is, you continue and when you get to 11, when you do this check which says 11 is, is 11 less than or equal to 10, that is not true, that is false, so you stop. That's how you count when you want to rub the floor with your broom and that's how you do it in programming as well. Remind, recalling it, start from somewhere, from one, increment one, two, three, four, five, and finally get, when you get to a certain value which ends, you just stop. And this final thing is a check which says, is a condition met? So the condition you have is, is the counter greater than um, some value, let's say 100 in the case with the brooming, but it can be anything with different problems. That's how you can um, utilize for loops. Okay, let's see an example. So, what we said is we will get a broom, take it with your hand, put your second hand as well. This is initialization, so you do it here. Okay. Oh shit, I forgot to put my quotes. So the first thing you do is you initialize. So you get your broom, you put your hands on it, you get everything ready. The next thing you do is you start cleaning. So you say, um, move to the next step, move to the next step and rub the floor. That's it. If I execute this now, I'll see the initialization. Imagine that printing it on the terminal means that you've done it. You see the initialization and then you see the step, the part where you cleaned, but we just did it once. If you want to do it 100 times, what you can do is you can take this and copy it 100 times. Okay. That's one way to do it, but since we're clever, we will apply what we already learned. We will apply a for loop. So we say, okay, we have our counter and our counter starts at zero. And when, until, while our counter is less than 110 for simplicity, execute the body and increase by one every time. So we do that um, and let's see what will happen now so <clears throat> you will get our initialization code and we get this once twice three four five six seven eight okay we got to eight I lost it. Okay, cool. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we did this ten times. How did it work? Well, I will show you with the debugger in order to understand it better. So uh, start debugging. We've already learned how debugging works. Now you will get. Um, uh, uh, an opportunity to practice it okay so we got we set our breakpoint in our for loop and we start we have our counter it begins at zero so you can see the zero here it starts at zero and this is our variable name then mm, f10 we check is the counter less than 10 it's not so we um execute our body which is move to the next step and run the floor, rub the floor let's see what happens so we initialized our brooming and we cleaned one part of our room after that we get to the part which is incrementing so after you've done cleaning one part you say you you increment you say if you had one you say two so you say one two three four that E, that transition is the, iterate, the in, incrementation. So we increment our variable, 
it becomes one and again we check this is a bit tricky because we check on every step step that's something to understand that um, in programming in order to you know make sure we will <coughs> in order to make sure we will um, do this 10 times exactly 10 times we check on every step normally when you're brooming you might you know skip that part because you know that when you get to 10 you know when you got to 10 okay but in programming you can skip it and you have to check it every time so what you do essentially is you say one is one less than 10 okay it is continue two is two less than 10 okay continue three is three less than 10 okay continue and on and on and on until you get 10 is 10 less than 10 no bye bye i'm done so that's what our program will do now we've incremented our variable to one we check if one is less than 10 it's, it, it is so we continue executing we execute another part here you see our second line just printed out again increase we get two check if two is less than 10 it is we continue increase at the same moment we have already printed out the next uh, line check if 3 is less than 10 it, it is continue on and on and on okay so this happened multiple times as you see we're doing the same thing but instead of copying pasting something 10 times we just tell it you know have a counter and count how many times you've executed if you get to 10 stop which means essentially print it 10 times so um we print out everything oh i sorry i missed the final part excuse me about that um i will have to do it again just just getting to the final part i want you to show you what happens in the end that's an interesting point six seven eight nine okay so at this moment we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we have nine par parts, nine times a line printed, and the tenth time is just being printed. So we print it for the tenth time, and our counter is at nine. We increment nine by one, and we get to the value ten. And finally, we check if ten is less than ten. So ten less than ten. This is not true if it was 10 less than or equal to 10 it would be but if, if it's only 10 less than 10 it's not true so we stop and when we stop we exit our for loop and we continue with our program in this case it just ends its execution so that's how a for loop works we count <coughs> initialize initialize increment every time so one two three four five and on every step check if the value we're incrementing has reached a given um is is still meeting a given condition okay so in this case the condition is that the value is less than 10. it is meeting it until it gets to 10 when we start so that's what a for loop is and in the next part we will learn how to actually apply it to solve some problems for now, I want you to experiment with it and see what happens. Actually, I will give you a challenge. I want you to start using the for, this for loop, but start playing with these values here. I want you to change this to five, see what will happen. And actually, before you see what will happen, I want you to think and guess what will happen, okay? So if you change it to five, before running your program, Try to write on paper how many times you think this will execute and award yourself something if you guess it correctly. If not, I don't know, um, get beaten by something or I, I don't know, wh whatever you decide. So change this, change this to 5, change this to 50, change this to 12, change this to 2. See what will happen, see why, think why that will happen. Okay, experiment. And finally, I want you to go here and change this plus plus to plus equals five. 
run that program of course you have you have to change this value so let's say you start by 5 and go to 50 run this program and guess how many times of course beforehand how many times this will execute try to do this with different things and think why that happens okay that's your challenge and in the meantime i will be waiting for you in the next video when we will actually solve our first problem with the for loop see you okay now i hope you just got heated up uh you you know uh prepared your programming muscles and now you're ready to get in some more info some more knowledge actually and start applying it in some cool problems and that's why now we're proceeding to nested loops what a nested loop is and how we use it so essentially a nested loop is a loop which is run inside another loop and i know this sounds funny but what it means is so you have a for loop here it's executing and you have another for loop inside of it the the specific code doesn't matter for now we'll go through it that, that's what a nested loop is. And you can have many nested loops. You can have one, you can have four. You can nest loops inside each other. And at first, when you encounter nested loops, it's a bit funny to understand how they work. Um, simply because, well, you know, um, it's, it's kind of unobvious, okay? That's why, that's why let's go through an example. So imagine that uh, we want to do this task this time we want to do it with a nested loop how does a nested loop do work well instead of printing this in this way we can use a nested loop for it so we can write for int j equals zero to n write an asterisk i will explain don't worry uh, and then we just write a new line, okay. Uh, actually like this. Okay, so what did I just do? Well, I said that for every um, part of this for cycle, I want you to do another voice for cycle inside of it. So this here is the row. So this is the row of our rectangle. What I'm saying is for every row of this rectangle, I want you to print out n columns. That's it. We did the, the same thing previously, but this time we're doing it with the full cycle. So what you can imagine now is that this is standalone. That is, you don't have this uh, thing here. If I execute it like this, what you will see is 10 asterisks asterisks uh, I have no idea how this is spelled um, but anyways I, I am sure you understand me you know we are friends so what I'm trying to say here is that you have 10 asterisks here and um, that's it okay and if you put this code this this code snippet here well sir this code snippet here inside another for loop it means I want you to do this which is print 10 asterisks uh, I hope there are 10 just imagine they are print that 10 times after that again we're in a four cycle here notice that we finish this cycle and we start the next so in the next cycle do it again finish this cycle go to the next one and do it again on and on and on that's it that's how a for loop works so you have a nested for loop so you have a normal for loop if you have this stand alone like this as i showed you this is nothing new you should be able to understand this code already this is the new part when we get this code and we put it inside another nested loop that, that's, that's the interesting part here because this time what we're essentially saying is I want you to print 10 asterisks and I want you to do it n times okay or 10 times doesn't matter so 
in order for you to understand a bit better let me go through the debugger with this okay so I run the debugger I say n is 5 and there I start so I start my outer for loop that's the most outer one outermost one and I start with i is equal to 0 by the way another a common convention is if you use nested loops to use the invite identifiers i for the outermost loop j for the come on if this doesn't print j okay j for the inner loop and k afterwards this doesn't print no k is the uh, second nested loop so if i had another nested loop inside my nested loop it would be with an identifier k that's just something to have in mind and if that uh distracts you don't worry i will change them soon because i don't like them either okay so let, let's get back to our debugger okay so we start with our four cycle and we're at the first step so this is step one step one now we start executing okay so we start executing this and it says print an asterisk so you already know how to do this we start from zero print a star and now if you go to your uh, screen you see one star here okay we continue we print the second one we increment j we print the next one three four and finally we end okay so that's how our full loop concluded we printed five stars and at the end what i'm doing is i'm putting a new line this new line is so that we the next thing we're going to print starts from the next line not from the one we're currently on so notice how this blinking cursor here is on the second line if i execute this line the blinking cursor is on the next line so essentially what console write one means is take the cursor here and move it to the next line so when we start writing from now on we'll start writing from the next line and that's it that's how our inner loop concluded but now we continue and we don't end our program we actually continue with the second part of the outer for loop and now i is equal to, to one and what we do in this for loop is we again execute the inner loop so we again say i want you to print five asterisks and i do that several times finally we end and as you see we have our second line that's it that's essentially what a nested loop is um, and we continue we go to the next part of the outer loop we execute this and if i execute this a couple of times at one point our outer loop will finish as well and we would have our rectangle print okay so i'll just go fast forward a bit okay now we finish and that's it that's our uh, rectangle or square call it what you wish doesn't matter okay to help you better understand this uh oh that, that's one of my slide decks that doesn't matter so oh, okay cool to help you better understand this um let's draw it out so we have our for loop i equals zero i less than 10 or let's put it at 5 because it's easier i plus plus that's our outer, outer loop and that's our inner loop j equals 0 j less than 5 j plus plus our inner loop okay i'll even put the brackets here oh sorry uh, normally you put it here doesn't matter okay and now what i say is print a star 
we finish our loop then we say print print new line and that's it okay okay cool so we have this that that's essentially our code in a bit more simplified version so what happens now well we have two counters so we have i which is okay i'll write it hmm okay so we have i and we have j so these are our two counters and what happens now well imagine that this is our screen and what we say is start the for loop the outermost for loop this one which means i is equal to zero so when i is equal to zero that's when my loop starts then we start our inner loop with which is iterated with j so when j is zero we print a star okay that's it we finish go to the next one j becomes one when j is one we print a star again go to the next one when j is two we print another star go to the next one three well this was not on the same line um, four and at one point j becomes equal to five and when j is five that's when our loop concludes because if you recall the condition we have here is that j should be less than five so we got to a point where j was equal to five as you see here and five is not less than five therefore our loop concludes okay cool so that was our outer loop then we print a new line we may just we won't write anything here just imagine that next we'll write the next star from the next line so when this ends our loop is no more so we can just delete this however what happens now is we get to this line here which means that our outer loop continues so we execute this step i plus plus okay so we increment i and it becomes one maybe i'll just write it with black it's easier well it's bolder that's why okay so i gets incremented and we check is i less than five no it's not well yes it is actually because it is one therefore we continue with our loop and what does our loop do well we do our we perform our nested loop again so when we do that let me delete this it means that we start playing with j again so what does what do we do in the inner loop when j is equal to zero well well we print an asterisk then we increment j it becomes one we print another one then j is equal to two we print another one j is equal to three we print another one j is equal to four print another one j is equal to five and we stop okay at this point again we get to this part here and we stop executing our loop because 5 is not less than 5 therefore we will stop printing asterisk again we move the our cursor on the next line due to this instruction and we finally get to the end of this part of the loop and we move on so the next step is to increment i well i changes to 2 and what does it happen when i changes to two we start performing our loop again that's it and when we start performing our loop again we can delete this and start from zero so again j equals to zero print an asterisk one print two three four and five i'll just fast forward 
did I print five? Yes, I did. We end our loop and again we increment the i. So this continues a bit. When i is equal to three, again we go through all these procedures with uh, the inner loop. I'm sure you already uh, are acquainted with it. And we just print five stars. Then i changes to four. Four is less than five. We perform our inner loop. And finally, i gets equal to 5, and now this condition is not met. 5 is not less than 5, therefore we stop. So that's it. That's how, a, how our nested loops execute. If you need more time to understand it, then spend some time, analyze this, think about it, and do some tasks. When you perform some, when you practice a bit, you will get a firmer grip of this concept. For now, it's enough to just understand in theory the basics and the practice is up to you. That's why I urge you to do our exercises and perform the task which lie ahead. So that's that's essentially a nested loop. Um, we went through this. We saw that a loop is basically an inner loop is basically something repeated n times where n is how however much times the outer loop gets executed that's it we already saw that um, now we have this simple task here we have to print a square of asterisks but notice that this time we have a space so let's do it well since we have a space this time, we will just put a space here. We already know how to print asterisks, and let's see if this works. As you see, it does. The only difference I did, I did is that this time, at every step, at every column, by the way, one thing which will help you a lot is if you change these variables to row and column, this will help you a lot just because it's more easier to see where you're at, more easier to see what you're doing. Essentially what this means is this is responsible for the rows of our shape and this is responsible for the columns. This will just be easier for you to get it, okay? So when we execute now our task, as you see, it executes correctly. So let's try and try square of stars. Submit. Okay, and we get 100 points. That's it. Uh, by the way, if you notice here, this task is done in a bit of a different way here in this solution. Notice how we print the star here, the asterisk. I will just call it star, please. Forgive me for that, it's easier. Um, and then we do this four cycle where we start from one, not zero, and we finish at n. Now, as you notice, we are printing one star in excess. However, the, the shape we get as a result is still correct value. It's still the correct amount. The, the amount of columns you have is still correct. Why is that? And I'll give you a hint. It is something related to this condition here. Essentially, what this loop will do is it will not make n iterations. It will actually make n minus 1 iterations. So if n is 5, it will make 4 iterations instead of 5. Think about why is that. And in the meantime, I'll see you in the next video. Try out this exercise um, and have fun because this is a fun lecture. I am enjoying it. I really hope you are enjoying it as much as I do. See you soon.